Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at new things coming to the Blender ecosystem in 2023. Ton Rosendahl, the chairman of the Blender Foundation, has just released this blog post on the official Blender website, which basically outlines all of the exciting things coming this year. So I figured we'd sit down, take a look, and have a little talk through what's coming. Some of the projects talked about in this blog post are things I know a lot of people are excited for. There are some things in here which I think might have been pushed back or we just didn't hear much about since the original announcement. So let's take a look. The upcoming year is going to be interesting for Blender. Aside from the Blender or community effort to keep core functionality stable and up to date, several high profile projects have started already that, fingers crossed, might get realized this year. Now I take this last bit with a pinch of salt, you know how things change, project priorities get shifted around, things don't always get finished on time, so just keep that in mind while taking a little look through this post. So first of all, Vulkan and Metal, OpenGL currently powers user interface, 3D viewports and Eevee, however it's expected to be deprecated by the industry in the coming years. Blender developers already work for many years to prepare a move away from OpenGL, basically trying to make Blender future-proof. Vulkan is the cross-platform successor to OpenGL with many opportunities to improve performance and new features like ray tracing. The Blender Foundation will invest developer time to finish a migration to the Vulkan graphics API in 2023. All right, so that's cool. That should be like a pretty big leap this year, moving it to a much more future-proof cross-platform graphics API. In parallel and using this development, Apple engineers have been working on making Blender fully compatible with the Metal graphics API on macOS. This project is also expected to wrap up in 2023. So again, from the sounds of it, 2023 seems to be a pretty big future-proofing year for Blender. Real-time viewport compositing. Oh boy, I know this is one a lot of people are excited for. This project adds a new compositor backend, taking advantage of GPU acceleration to be performant enough for real-time interaction. So that's one question that's always been rolling around with Blender. You know, comparing it to other softwares, why is it that you can stack like 60 post-processing effects in a game engine and it runs really, really smoothly? All different kinds of weird stylistic effects, lens, dirt, bloom, whatever. But as soon as you put one glare node in Blender, suddenly, oh boy, a sinkhole opens up from under your computer and the project is just gone. Okay, that's an overreaction. They're very inefficient, but also CPU reliant from what I know. So that's the important point here. This project adds a new compositor backend taking advantage of GPU acceleration to be performant enough for real-time interaction. As a first step, this backend powers the new viewport compositor, which applies the result of the compositing nodes directly in the 3D viewport. Artists do not have to wait for a full render to start compositing for faster and more interactive iterations. That's great, especially for people doing stylistic work that rely on that immediate feedback when they're experimenting with different types of visual styles. But also, I mean, it's just going to be useful for every use case, even like super photo realistic work, being able to make tweaks, especially balancing how the lighting in your scene interacts with any post-processing effects, which also make use of that lighting. Just being able to visualize every step of that workflow in one go is quite important, I think. So I think this is going to be a big step. The initial version of this feature will be available in Blender 3.0. 5. Okay, that's a promise. The next steps are to support more nodes and features and in the long term bring GPU acceleration to the existing compositor. Oh yes, excellent. If you can get that done this year, well done Blender team. I'm sure a lot of people will really appreciate it. And of course on this blog post, which I'll try and link below, for each of these sections you can click through and it will take you to other referenced blog posts about the subject as well. So you can take a look through and see like the earlier demonstrations of the real-time compositor here. But we're not going to take a look at all of those. You can do that in your free time. So the next section is brush assets. The asset system and browser will fully support brushes for painting and sculpting. This makes it easy to use, make and share bundles of brushes with others. Lovely. That kind of opens up a whole new world of tools development that creators can share with each other. Sharing sculpting brushes has always been doable in Blender, but a little bit tricky. You know, it never really felt like it was intended for that. Having a more unified system where painting and sculpting is connected with the new asset browser is going to be a fantastic thing. I've been making massive use of the asset browser with my paid products now, especially the procedural material tools and I've even got an entire add-on that's specifically focused around working with the asset browser that's the modular workspaces add-on so I'm glad they're trying to make things more connective around that feature. Okay Blender apps. Thanks to Blender's very high level of customization using Python scripting it's possible to build up Blender from scratch with your own user interfaces and editor layouts. This combined with bundling blend files, assets, data, you can create it to make custom tools or complete experiences. Okay so Blender apps has always been this little kind of SO Esoteric feature that's been talked about over the past few years. Actually, I think since the Blender 2.8 code quest. Basically, imagine Blender being so customizable that you can create your own variations of the software. And if I click through to this 
older blog post, you can see, in a nutshell, Blender apps are experiences powered by Blender. Blender apps can do anything that Blender can, plus so much more when extended. They are designed to be portable and focused on a specific usage. So imagine a use case for education, for example, where there's a more simplified version of Blender to teach people how 3D systems work. You can see here, a very simple way of creating 3D scenes, or that could go in the other direction and create versions of Blender for much more complex production pipelines or even small games. This is something I'm interested in seeing more about because to me, it sounds like one of those features where I think Ton has a very clear vision for it in his mind, but it's going to be one of those things that will be difficult to communicate to the general wider community that's just looking for more Blender features rather than different strange specific use cases for a customized version of Blender, if that makes sense. But I am personally all for customization. Like the more we can customize Blender, the better, especially from the add-on developer perspective, I want to have much more control over the user interface. But anyway, we'll see more about this project in the future. Let's move on to the next one. The extensions platform. So this is one I did a video about a while back that not many people watched. Basically, the extensions platform is going to be a way for people to be able to auto update their add-ons, which is something I think a lot of people will really appreciate, but it won't be for every add-on. So there are a few caveats. The Blender Foundation will launch an official community moderated website for sharing, discovering and downloading add-ons, themes and asset libraries. The extension the extension site will only offer GNU GPL compliant software or CC by share alike compatible content. No commercialization will happen on the platform. It aims to be attractive for artists and add-on developers to freely share their work on Blender.org, even if they choose to be using third-party services to generate revenues with the same or similar extensions. Okay, so for example, if I took one of my add-ons like Holt Tools, which is a GNU GPL compliant add-on, that would be perfect for this website, even though it's available on Gumroad and Blender Market for $1 you know, and I can raise money using donations through Gumroad, especially that's still allowed. You know, it's allowed to be on all of these platforms. It will fit on the extensions platform. And if it's on here, it means that people inside of Blender will be able to keep it automatically updated whenever I push new releases. So it's an interesting idea. I think this will be very useful for people. And if you click through to the older blog post, you'll be able to see some like mockups for how this might look on the web. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Okay, so EV next, this is going to be a good one. It's going to be the next stage for the Eevee rendering engine. Quite an appropriate name, don't you think? Blender's real-time rendering engine, Eevee, as opposed to Cycles, has been evolving constantly since its introduction in Blender 2.8. The goal was to make it viable both for asset creation, in the way of like being able to visualize your full PBR pipeline for an asset in real time, and for final rendering. So just to explain that a bit more, that's why we have like the material preview mode in Blender, as well as the final render mode, continuing, and to support a wide range of workflows. However, thanks to the latest hardware innovations, many new techniques have become viable and Eevee can take advantage of them. Expect new features such as screen space global illumination, more efficient shading and lighting, improved volume rendering and panoramic cameras. Okay, all of that is great. Global illumination is something that's been sorely missing in Eevee. Screen space global illumination is great, but it would be nice to have or innovate more complex GI methods in Eevee. Um, something I've been thinking for a while is that it would be nice to have a way to kind of mesh data between cycles and Eevee in interest ways I just I wonder how possible that is whether at any point in the future we'd be able to have both engines kind of virtually running at the same time maybe even in a limited capacity so we can take some data from cycles and combine it with Eevee to make the results more accurate but I feel like that's kind of more complex and a tall order don't really know how possible that would be in the future but I'm just thinking more for like ray tracing and lighting perspectives is would there be any way to kind of use cycles as like an informative guide for Eevee but anyway that's just like my conjecture for future ideas but in the meantime Eevee next Next, it's going to be focusing on screen space global illumination. And I'm also very interested in the improved volume rendering because volume effects in Eevee have always been quite lackluster, especially when compared to cycles. Back in the day, there were a bunch of us doing like nebulaic renders using Eevee, trying to see how far we could push it, what kind of realistic and cool looking results we could get, especially in terms of animations. But the problem was the Eevee volume system was using like a cards technique, where as you were flying through, you would be able to see all this flickering on these very defined layers and it was quite difficult to get good results with that. So it'll be interesting to see if the improved volume rendering coming from Eevee Next will be able to assist us with animations like that. And panoramic cameras, very nice. Okay, so next up, simulation nodes. This is a really exciting aspect of geometry nodes that in recent Blender Community Roundup videos on my channel, I've pointed out some really interesting creators making some like cool projects with this. Basically, simulation nodes allows you to run a set of nodes, like a function you've created many times, practically in 
real time so that you can simulate a change in data. Now, this will allow you to do all kinds of different animations and complex generative type effects in geometry nodes. It basically opens a whole world of potential and can drastically reduce the number of nodes you need to create an effect. Because before what people would do in geometry nodes is if they wanted to repeat a process again and again, they would kind of bundle it into a node group and just have like hundreds of these node groups running one after the other just to try and simulate a loop. Now you don't really need to worry about that. With geometry nodes getting hair support last year, this year the focus will be on simulation for physics and beyond. That's another important point, being able to simulate physics, which is essentially just a change in data. The system will be designed for interactivity and experimentation with simulations running in the viewport at their own clock or editing objects and nodes. This is going to be a really fun one to play with, and I know that a lot of really cool tutorials are going to start appearing in the community. If you want to learn more about this, you can click through on the Geometry Nodes Workshop 2022, and if you scroll down, you will find the simulation, simulation node section. We can see the general design of how this works, but as I also said in a previous video, you can actually download an experimental branch of Blender now and try the simulation nodes for yourself. Okay, this next one isn't really as interesting for the mass Blender user base out there. It's more for Blender developers. Upgrade of developer.blender.org with Gitia. I don't know if that's how you say it. Blender developers currently use Fabricator for project management, code review, and issue tracking. Unfortunately, that software was discontinued, so we are looking for a good replacement. The choice was to use Gitia. Oh, Gitia? Gitia. Gitte, which is a fully free open source software project with functionality similar to GitHub. The main job was to migrate the full 20 years of development history of Blender to this new Git-based software management system. 20 years? Crazy. Here's to the next 20. All right, next up, character animation. Animation and rigging is going to get a full makeover in the coming years, including making the core design future-proof and many ideas to improve the experience for animators. A large group of developers and expert animators are involved with it. Kickoff was at the last Blender conference and you can read the report below. This is great. I know a lot of people get into Blender to do animated content in all different forms for video games, for visual effects, for actually just making animated films. So I think it's great that they're actually putting a significant amount of like design effort into new animation animation tools. Of course, just like before, you can click through to take a look at this blog post here, the future of character animation. There is a lot of information in here to go over. So if you are specifically interested in animation with Blender, then definitely worth doing a bit of a deep dive into that. And there's more. The Grease Pencil team will come with ambitious plans. There's an exciting texture painting and sculpting speed up coming and Hydra render delegates and other USD improvements are under development. The procedural texturing project, while not having a concrete roadmap and resources yet, is still a goal. On behalf of everyone, best wishes for a great 2023. Ton Rosendahl, chairman of the Blender Foundation. All right, fantastic. So that's what's coming in Blender this year. A lot of exciting stuff to look forward to, and you can rest assured that we will definitely be keeping track of it on this channel. So if you're not already, make sure to subscribe and consider ringing the notification bell if you want to stay informed on all that's going on. On my side, I've been doing lots of different development projects. There are some really exciting things I can't wait to show you coming down the pipeline. I don't want to speak too soon, but over on my second channel, I talk about some of these projects in our little podcast episodes. Also, I'll just throw in a quick note here, by Gen version 10, is in development, but version 9.2 has been released, which addresses a Mac and Linux specific issue to do with appending content that was introduced in Blender 3.4. So if you've been waiting for a fix on Bygen, then that's available for you to download now. There's a backlog of content for the community material packs, so new materials are coming and other things, but I'll save all this exciting info for our upcoming projects for future videos. I also want to say hi to all the new people that came over from Ducky's recent video. Hi, great to meet you. Feel free to check out all the other videos on our channel. And if you made it this far through the video, consider putting a wrench emoji in the comments. If you do that, I'll be able to see who actually made it this far through the video. I love this because I recognize a ton of you in the comments. It's always uplifting as well to see that. So yeah, I won't keep you for much longer. You can sign up to my Patreon if you want to help support all of these videos, all of my projects. And on curtishold.online slash store, you can find a variety of free and paid tools that I've created and also some recommendations for cool tools that I enjoy from around the community. So yeah, lots to explore. I'll leave it there. Have a fantastic day, everyone, and I will see you next time.